All right, so for today's session, we're mostly just going to be talking about this week's case studies, right? So um, looking at the Apollo Shoes mini case, um, I will throw this out here. Would you rather spend more time during class working on and talking about the Apollo Shoes mini case or the discussion cases? We'll, we'll probably discuss both, but um, we can definitely spend more time on these if people want to, if you actually want to collaborate together on these at all. Yeah, I'd probably say the discussion ones, just because, I mean, we have one that's due tonight, right? Yes, yep. So I think that, I'd, personally, I think that'd be more beneficial, I guess. Okay. To do that one, but. All right. Um, yeah, so we can look at both of these, but so as far as the mini case goes, um, there's two sections on here. Um, this one just is, okay, looking at whether your conclusions, um, let's see, what are we asking? We've got the file here that we need to download for all of these. And don't forget to upload your files because there are things on, for most of these, um, there are things on the files that are in addition to what is in the previous ones. Now, um, it's important to note that some of the stuff will be things related to um, what was done earlier in the um, in the semester. So, um, but there will be an instruction sheet on each of these that tells you what the new part is you're supposed to be completing. Um, so here on this one, um, complete all the steps on the audit program as identified by your manager. So each time you're going to have new items on this audit program that you're going to be completing that are highlighted in green, right? So for this week, they're saying, okay, identify significant controls for major con uh, transaction cycles, select a sample of transactions to test, document any deviations, and then document internal controls related to purchases, identify significant controls. And these are all going to be, I think, out here under this work paper C5. So, <laughs> so looking out here, they've got some example vouchers that are posted here. <laughs> You're going to want to examine the new vouchers that are posted out there and say, okay, based on this voucher that I'm looking at, was an order number assigned? So go through each of these and say, was there an order number assigned? If so, it's effective. If not, it's not effective. Um, the sales orders require customer name, phone number, address, product name, and quantity in order to generate. So were all was all that information out there or was any of it missing? Um, all sales orders made offline were reviewed and entered daily. Um, so they noted that some of them, it was not applicable because potentially maybe there wasn't, maybe a sales order didn't go through because it was incomplete or something like that. Um, but look at the date that things were entered and make sure that it was appropriate. Credit manager reviews all new credit requests. Did they sign off on it? When credit is not approved, orders are not filled unless payment is made. So if it was something where they denied, were denied credit, was a payment associated with it before they allowed it to go through? Invoices are reviewed for correct products prices. So basically a lot of these are saying, hey, did these get approved and signed off by somebody that all of this stuff was out there? Um, I decided that like and whatnot. So that's basically what you're doing here is just looking at these and ticking off whether they met the requirements that the uh, client said was in their process. So it's kind of like a, um, uh, I mean, it, it, this is very much like what you would be doing in a real audit. For certain things and then don't forget to sign off your name i will take a time i won't take a lot off for you not signing off on it but i will take something off and then also make sure that you sign off on it um, in the um, internal controls program like put your initials in here that you did it right so these are just little parts of this project that are related to this is prior week um, flowchart but this is just walking through oh okay this is what the process is supposed to be um, 
Here's their revenue narrative. You can read through this to get some information on what they're doing as far as how these are supposed to work in their sales process. Um, and then here's their accounting manual. So all of this, uh, we did the fraud discussion, I believe in a previous step. Yeah, so, so basically reading these ones and then completing C5 and then under C6 here, um, you're just reviewing the purchases narrative and then there's purchase control testing, which I don't see the stuff out here for this. Let's see. Hmm. I don't see the, oh, so I don't think this one is assigned yet. So that's probably in the next Please. section. Uh, yeah, we're mostly dealing with the revenues here, I think. So, uh, so that's what we're looking at here. And then, so these are what some of the five or the six vouchers that they gave you. So you're going through here and just line by line looking to see if, um, so like see down here, they've got a quality check box where people signed off. Um, is all the information complete? You can, once you get used to the list, you, you can just, if you were to like put this on a separate screen next to it, you can just go right down that list and be like effective, 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 check right through it. The first one will take you a little longer. And then after that, you'll just be like ticking off the points and it'll go really fast. So it's not as uh, time consuming as it sounds like it will be. Um, and there are subsequent pages pages here. Okay, payment was received, credit approval approved, et cetera, looking for those things. Um, deposit received, the dollar amount um, was 10%. Um, and then on here, oh, we've got a sales order number, we've got an invoice number, you know, here's who approved all this stuff. So uh, that's the kind of stuff that we're looking at here. And they were kind enough to outline some of the stuff that you should be looking for to help you out to identify what it is, because they know you're not going to be experienced auditors who are like churning through all this stuff. So can we, um, in like the document in Excel, like the C5 page, can we just do like E and D for like effective and deficient? Or do you want us to write out like the full word just to um, like make it a little bit quicker, I guess? But uh, it looks like it's a drop down. So I think oh, you okay. just select it. So you can just click which one you want. Cool. So that'll be easy. So just click and grab it. Anybody have any questions on that? I mean, like it's boring, but it's not because of me. All right. So, yeah. So make sure you're keeping up with these. They are worth um, credit and they are marked down if they're late. So. Uh, there and the case studies are like a third of your grade or a quarter of your grade, like as much or more than the homework. So make sure that everybody is working on those and uh, getting those turned in. So then overall, they they just asked, um, you know, so here you're going to go on and look at a couple of these and mark them down in here. And then um, for this one, Um, check off the ones that had deficiencies on them here. It doesn't look like there is an upload on this one. So, um, but that, you know, use that spreadsheet to help you track it and whatnot. I don't know why I didn't put the upload on this one, but it's the same typical questions. You'll get to the same place. If part of it's deficient, then it's deficient, right? So, <clears throat> And then these are all the listed uh, requirements here. All right, so that's the Apollo Mini Shoes case for this week. So let's talk really quickly about um, this Herbalife case study for a few minutes. So this is a super short one, less than one page long. So Herbalife, um, Take a minute here and give it, I'll just pause the recording here for a sec. Okay, so let's talk about this one really quick. Um, I don't know if any of you follow the Reddit accounting board or not, but um, at the time this happened, um, 
there was definitely discussion on there about it, like uh, hearing about it happening in real time. There's always people from the large firms who hear about like, so undoubtedly within KPMG, people knew about it, heard about it, and were chattering about it long before it became public. And then of course it goes out on the internet and goes on its merry way. Um, so Scott London was a partner at KPMG uh, in charge of a huge section of their audit practice. Some of the companies that he audited were Skechers and Herbalife, so two pretty big recognizable names. And um, he was making about $900,000 per year in salary as a partner, so not too shabby. Um, and um, everything was beautiful, wonderful, great, perfect career, et cetera. Well, then one day he's out golfing with one of his buddies and mentions a comment about something that's about to happen at one of these firms that he's auditing, right? Something that's going to be going public. Probably was just like itching on his tongue, like, oh my gosh, this is, I've got the skinny on this, you know, gossip, right? Um, first of all, it's, it's, it's super not okay to talk about client confidential information. Like if once it becomes public, then it's public nature. Like, so yes, it's public who the auditors are for these companies and that they're performing the audits. The results of the audits are not public information or anything that they find until they are announced publicly and the SEC disclosures come out. And it's a super key part of our financial reporting process that everybody gets the information fairly and at the same time. And so theoretically, people have all the information necessary uh, to make their investing decisions on a fair playing field, right? And there are laws against insider trading. Um, even if you are not a covered individual or a family member like those people we talked about earlier, it is illegal for you to trade, make trades on the stock market um, based on non-publicly available information. And likewise, as an auditor, it is illegal for you to pass that information to somebody, um, you know, whether you know that they are going to be making investments in response to what you're telling them or not. It's disclosure of, uh, you know, insider information. So if that person goes out and trades on it, even when you don't think they will and gets caught, then you are responsible for it, whether your intention was for them to trade on it or not. Now, in this case, how did it start out? So initially he started talking about it and then, um, and then maybe at some point his friend made a, went out and made a trade and then he came back and brought him a thank you gift because he made out like a bandit on his trades, right? And I'm sure the first time that gift was given, he was probably pretty taken aback, like, whoa, oh my gosh. Um, and probably like sweating about it because he knew he was not supposed to do that. And maybe it hadn't occurred to him that his friend was gonna trade on that information initially. But then when nothing happened and he got this, then it's like, okay, it's cool. Um, and then, you know, he either, either the friend put pressure on him because he said, hey, you've done this before. If you don't, I'm going to turn you in, in which case, probably not a great friend, probably not that scenario. Um, but he probably just was like, hey, I could just throw out a few things every once in a while and, and this guy's going to bring me some nice gifts. So $50,000 in cash and gifts over time, including a $12,000 Rolex watch. watch. Um, got sued by KPMG because if they have people who are doing insider trading, it hurts the firm's reputation and potentially lost them that client, which is a huge dollar amount. Um, served 14 months in prison and paid $100,000 in fines. Now, um, do you think financial pressure was an issue with this fraud? No. <laughs> Probably not. If, at least we hope not. I mean, if he's making $900,000 a year and the $12,000 Rolex is what's breaking the bank, then there's way bigger issues going on with his finances than insider trading probably, right? Um, 
probably, it, do you think it was worth it? No. No, because he had a great career and he was doing wonderfully. And then he ends up in jail. Uh, I don't think it says here whether he ended up divorced, but I would say there's probably a reasonable likelihood that he ended up divorced after that. I know I wouldn't be super happy if my spouse was providing illegal information to people, or maybe he's a jerk and she was super excited. He was, in, he was gone for 14 months, who knows, but when he gets out of prison, he's not going to have a job anymore. Um, so, um, basically, I mean, this is, is, so he's committing insider trading fraud. Here's what's going on. So what are some of the ranges of penalties that could happen? loses like license or I mean if he has a CPA he probably lose that. Yeah. So who would be responsible for if he's gonna lose a CPA license, whose um domain would that be under? The AICPA. So the AICPA is actually a professional association for people who are CPAs, but they're not in charge of licensing. Um, state boards of accountancy in each state are who you would be licensed under. So if he's licensed in California, that would be who would be in charge of reviewing his license. It's possible he might have just gotten a suspension, um, a temporary suspension for a period of time, or maybe he was given corrective actions and fines. Um, is it possible to fully lose it? Oh yes, yep, it definitely is. He probably did, I would guess. Does it say, I don't think it says in here. Um, if he did or not, I didn't catch that anyway, but yes, you could totally lose your license for something like this. Um, depending, you can, you can lose your license actually for anything that's like considered an act discreditable. They make a, they have a very broad, um, definition in most states where if the board of accountancy just basically says, Hey, you embarrassed the hell out of our profession you're losing your license or getting censured or whatever. So they have they have quite a bit of leeway and there is precedent. I would imagine um, there's a really significant chance that he um, lost his license. I'd have to look it up to find out if he actually did or not. He definitely lost his job and he's not gonna be able to get another job for $900,000 a year. The unfortunate part is that he may very well be able to get um, speaking engagements for $1,000 a pop at different things, talking about how stupid his mistake was, and people will pay him money to come and talk to people in ethics trainings and stuff for that. So, um, or maybe he started his own accounting firm after that and is, but there's a, so what can the PCAOB do? Because they don't actually bring the criminal charges. They don't actually have um, any jurisdiction over his actual license. What does the PCAOB have jurisdiction over? You want to take a guess? What can they prevent him from doing in the future? Doing the audits? Yeah, so they can say you can never do, you can never participate in an audit of a public company ever again. Like they can, they can come out there and just be like, nope, you're done. Um, so that sort of limits his career things. Like there's certainly things he can go do. Like he can go, uh, if he can find some place that doesn't care that he went to jail for 14 months uh, he, based on the fact that it was insider trading. He could probably get a job as a controller or a CFO somewhere. Um, the PCAOB can also say you cannot hold an executive position in a publicly traded company because that's a huge risk, right? Any publicly traded company is not going to want to touch this dude with a 10-foot pole because that puts their financial reporting with the SEC and the PCAOB at risk. So, um, so that is... Uh, definitely something that's out there. So, so he's probably going to be limited to much less lucrative careers going forward. Hopefully if he's been doing this for 29 years, let's see. So if he's, if he's been doing this for 30 years and he started when he was 22 years old, he's probably in his fifties, right? 
odds are if he's making that much money in his 50s, he's got a fair amount of retirement socked away. So he's probably just going to find something to keep himself busy until retirement time and then hang out even with that. But he's not going to have the retirement he would have had otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, and if he was fired, I don't know. So here's a question I don't know the answer to. I know that when you own shares in a partnership like that, or one of these larger firms, you're an, you're typically an equity shareholder, and you can. And then when you retire, your shares end up being passed to somebody else, like they get sold essentially to the next person who becomes partner. So they could be like potentially like buying those shares or taking a reduced cut of profits. So depending on, I'm assuming he probably had his shares paid for um, if he's making $900,000 a year. But hopefully, so he hopefully was not still paying those off. He probably would have gotten some money when he got fired just for returning his shares back into the pool, I would imagine. But I guess I don't know what their policies are, how that works. Like, do you forfeit your shares? How does that work? Um, because they definitely couldn't have him continuing to own shares because that would affect potentially affect KPMG. Um, so what do you think that the penalties that were assessed were appropriate? He could have got fined a little more. He could have potentially been fined more. It looks like they fined him enough that it probably it covered the cash that was identified. But I, yeah, I guess it doesn't say how much KPMG sued him for. Yeah, that's true. It didn't say that either. So he may very well. Yeah, they could. They probably sued him for a lot more than he was fined for. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to do some fun. I'm going to Google this and find out what he ended up. And then in terms of like, um, like his license, I don't know if I would like, I feel like completely revoking it would be a little harsh just because he was doing it for so long. Um, I don't know. Well, I, I guess I don't know if that would be grounds to either revoke it or just suspend it if he was doing it longer or shorter. I guess hmm. since he was doing it longer, it might be. I don't know. Huh. So it says here, it did say it. Where does it say in here that they sued him? Because I remember reading that too. Um, oh, be, and being sued by his former employer. Okay. So. When I Google this, it looks like they made a deal. Um, yeah, so it looks like they ended up making some kind of a deal with each other and, and there was not an actual lawsuit. Um, KPMG did have the potential for being sued by their clients whose information was passed because that's problematic for them as well. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of, does it say what kind of deal they made? It's probably, I'm sure it was confidential. It was probably some kind of a deal about him returning his shares back so, and or at a discount. <laughs> so yeah, so, so the firm didn't money. have to buy them back from him, get him out of there. Um, I mean, yeah, that's that kind of it's kind of the same thing as a lawsuit, I guess. Yeah, well, or maybe they filed the lawsuit and then they dropped it. That's possibly too. Because yeah, he could have been counting on that money that he would get from mm -hmm. selling those shares, even in like retirement. He could have planned around that too. Yeah. So let's take a minute then and um, look through the PTL Club one um, for a second here. So going on to this one. All right, so PTL Club, um, there's a bunch of questions here. Um, so 
in this particular case, obviously there was a lot of fraud going on as well. So it wasn't just an auditing issue here. I mean, there was definitely an auditing issue, but they kind of called out here, the whole fraud started, we don't know if it started with this or not, but um, Jim Baker had an affair with one of the secretaries, um, paid her $256,000 to drop a, a $12 million lawsuit. And then um, the IRS questioned $1.3 million in expenditures for the bakers, threatened their tax exempt status, et cetera. The biggest thing that was going on though, probably dollar wise, was that there, so there was, there was money going everywhere. They had a whole bunch of checking accounts. Um, the auditors were having trouble keeping track of it. They were bouncing checks. So they were clearly spending more money than they were taking in. And then they had this real estate racket where they had a, a resort hotel and um, people who were members in the PTL club would supposedly be able to buy into a partnership and then get a certain number of days of access at the hotel. They said they were only gonna sell 25,000 of these. So they would limit the number of people who could do it, but it turns out they sold 74,000 um, for one hotel. Um, and then 30 said they were gonna sell only 30,000 to another one. Oh yeah, so there was two different hotels, I think. Oh yeah, one sorry. Was, they said 25,000, they sold 66, and then one was 30,000, they sold 74. Yes, yep, yep. So yeah, so they were selling multiple times as many um, uh, 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 partnerships as there were, as they said that they would publicly, right? Um, they also had some bonuses going on. What did they do to try and get past the auditors with those bonuses so that the um, auditors would not uh, notice them in the minutes? Anyone catch that? I don't remember the word they used, but they would just add them to the minutes pretty much like after the fact. Yeah, addendums. They were putting, so they would have their minutes, quote unquote, these are the minutes. And then later on, they would do a quote unquote addendum to the minutes. So a separate attachment um, that approved with the bonus approval where they would, where the board would vote on this bonus. And then conveniently, when they gave all the minutes to them, they just wouldn't give them any of the addendums, right? Um, so that explains though, why it didn't get called out in the minutes necessarily, but there's a, there's a, a common audit procedure that could have super easily picked up on this, like go into the accounting records. And of course, no, now that I say this, this was in the early 1980s. So it would not have been unusual for all of the accounting records to have been on paper at that point. So um, like nowadays you could just go into the vendor list and do a skim and search for, you know, names of key parties and say, okay, what are all the checks that were written to uh, Jim and Tammy Faye Baker or the CFO or the CEO? Like, you know, any random people, you could have a list of the people that you wanted to see if checks were written to them search within the accounting records using the computers. And then you could be like, okay, these ones are all payroll. These ones are unusual checks. Let's audit the documentation associated with all of these checks. Back then, if you're dealing with paper check registers, um, this would have been skimming the check registers and who knows, maybe they put them as something else in the check register. So it was a lot easier to alter records back then because you could just code something as something else, you know? Um, but nowadays it would be it would be less likely that significant size checks. The other thing you could do is like just search for checks over a certain dollar amount and then pull all of them. That, that is something they could have done if they were looking at, I mean, bank statements existed back then, but of course they didn't necessarily have access to all that. And, and they, uh, they were saying there were problems getting access to all of the bank statements. So, and, and things were at different banks if they didn't want the auditors to see it. So they had quite a complex 
amount of stuff. Who even knows how much money was being deposited into those other accounts? There could have been other checking accounts that never even came to light too. That's a definite potential consideration. They said there's an unreasonably high number of separate bank accounts and problems with bounced checks. So <laughs> they could have been making enough money, but it was just being diverted in other ways as well. I guess it doesn't say, you know, what controls they had over signing checks in there specifically that I saw. Um, so it's from an auditing perspective, how did the like series go? Like what, what happened with the auditors? Who was auditing it? Were there changes in auditors? The light was. Um, but L and H was too. Yeah, Leventhal and uh, Horwa. So they came there. They came there. Auditor in eight, eighty-five, and then 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 eighty-five, I guess it's part of Deloitte, so it's oh. Um, yeah, Haskins and Cells. Um, had several firms, but Leventhal and Horwath, I, it says they went out of business, but there's Crow Horwath, Horvath out there still now. So I'm guessing some partners from there um, ended up being bought out and merged in as part of the bankruptcy, I would bet. But one of the things they talk about was how they had a specialty practice in finding tax write-offs for investors and in hotels. Um, and they ended up collapsing eventually after taking pay cuts for partners, declaring bankruptcy and putting 3,200 people out of work. So lots going on here. You know, there were auditing problems. There was clearly fraud problems. Um, So one of the things that was going on, they mentioned that Jim Baker was advertising the fact that they had these super high dollar firms that were auditing their financial statements. Our finances are great. We've got the best auditors, right? Um, should audit reports be used for soliciting investments, credit or sales in the manner that they did here? What do you think? So they're asking, is it okay what he was doing using the names of the firms that were auditing his company as like an advertising talking point for selling for the financial reliability of his company? Is that, I mean, it's not really normal behavior, but is that okay? Doesn't seem like it's wrong to do, I guess, because there's obviously value in having like a larger firm out of you yeah i mean there it's so it's kind of a known thing like you can provide more investor surety like from a reputational standpoint if you go with a larger well-known firm i mean that is a thing it's just normally people don't say that's a thing like yeah. they do that uh they also do it because a larger firms just tend to have more resources and more availability you know for doing things for your firm but um, but it, it's unusual for, for somebody to be crowing about who their auditing firm is. Um, cause what, if you're a person who doesn't know anything about CPAs and they're like, we've got like the rock superstars of auditors that are looking over our finances every year and making sure everything is above board. Um, like what, if you don't know anything about it, that sounds pretty great. Right. Mm -hmm. What does an average person not understand about audits, including a lot of people who actually work in business and maybe even get audits? As far as like what an auditor's duties are. It would be like a lot of it's based on like integrity and not as much like, obviously like reputation, but more like level of understanding or yeah, so how about how about um, the two of you who are online? Um, what does an audit actually tell us? 
It's like an opinion, I guess it's like an opinion, um, whereas like it provides reasonable assurance and not 100% assurance, which like some people I would think have the assumption that the auditors are right no matter what and they're 100% certain of like no material mistakes being in the financial statements. Right, it, it, it reduces, it says there's a, uh, we uh, are providing a level, a reasonable level of assurance that there is not material misstatement. We are not guaranteeing that there's not fraud. We're not even guaranteeing that there's not material misstatement. We're just saying that we've performed auditing activities that reduce the risk to an acceptable level, right? So an average person probably doesn't understand that. They don't understand, yes, there's still risk. They think somebody's come in here and gone through everything with a fine tooth comb and looked at all these transactions and there's no way that anything can be misstated because they that's that's sort of the image that Jim Baker was trying to put out there by saying that they had these big firms out there. So what can a firm do in response to that? If somebody is doing that, what would a firm's response be? What would you want to do as a firm to potentially correct that? Maybe just like make an announcement to the public that they can't be 100% sure that there's no mistakes. Yeah. And that is a double-edged sword, right? This is a lose-lose situation for the CPA firms because if they come out and are like, hey, thanks, We're, we love that you love us. However, it's not a sure thing. <laughs> what does that do to, the, you know, then there's the risk to their reputation for the audit practice. And then it brings back the, you know, the other side of the coin is people would be like, as soon as they find something, they'll be like, you admitted that you guys aren't doing your jobs, you know, or there's ways that they could, that could be spun against them. So they're sort of stuck. Probably the best way for them to respond to that is um, maybe just a general press release about auditor responsibilities to educate the public, you know, or asking the client to make a disclosure, make ask the client to make a public disclosure clarifying what an auditor's duties actually are. And if the client will not do that and they keep doing this, then you move on and go somewhere else because this is a problem, right? Nobody wants to, you know, have mud slung in their direction um, because if there's stuff going around, it's going to stick to somebody eventually. So um, probably having the client come back and refute it or saying we're leaving and then you can explain to them why we left <laughs> would be one way of going about it. Um, let's see, we made a lot of judgments during the audit. We were auditing the balance sheet and there was no reason in my judgment to look at this number after May 31st. So if you don't issue your, I mean, nobody issues the audit report the day after the time period ends. Like auditing takes time. The company typically is gonna take a month to six weeks just to finish getting their own internal stuff and prepare their financial statements. And you're auditing during that period at the same time, hopefully, but like you are required to audit the stuff that goes on between the financial statement date and the time that they're issued to see. And there's a whole section called subsequent events. <laughs> there's a disclosure, a required disclosure for subsequent events. Um, so if anything significant happens, you're responsible for stating in there like, hey, as of the financial statement date, yes, these were the numbers. However, here's a footnote that says if significant stuff went on afterwards. Um, and if you don't, if something significant goes on and you don't catch that as an auditor and make sure that they've disclosed it as a subsequent event in the footnotes, you're kind of responsible for that. So um, So what do you think about these questions here? I'm not gonna, you know, I'm gonna let you think about the questions for number two there, but just calling out that yes, they are responsible for subsequent events. Um, so why would a staff auditor want to be part of a client's team and consent to questionable practices rather than being an independent watchdog and contesting such practices? 
they don't lose their job? Yeah, because uh, maintaining clients, like back then, especially like before SOX, it was a different ball game, right? So before Enron, client independence was viewed very differently. Clients could audit a firm, could do their taxes, could do consulting work for them. That was like the cushy byproduct of getting an audit. So they would often um, do the audit under bill or under uh, budget for the audit, didn't care because they were getting all of these other jobs from the client as part of this audit. So there was a very close relationship. Um, like in the Enron case, um, a quote that I just remember, you know, years and years after reading about this was that a person who walked into their offices and looked at all the people working in their finance department, even if you worked there, you probably couldn't point out who was an Enron employee versus who actually was an employee of Arthur Anderson, because they spent the Arthur Anderson staff were so enmeshed and uh, embedded working right in the workplace right alongside the, the workers there. And so for some of these really large firms where there was a lot of stuff going on, I don't think that was necessarily the case here, but those were not uncommon types of relationships for auditors to have with their clients. You know, they were golfing together, they'd hang out. They were working with these people throughout the year if it was a really large company. So for a staff auditor to come in and um, it was, that was the culture of uh, auditing back then. It was very different. Um, and as you said, you don't want to get fired. You don't want to be the person who is coming in with guns blazing, calling out stuff that makes the client ticked off. Um, they will fire you before they will lose their um, audit, at least back then. Now the culture is very different. Most, and, and this is firm dependent, right? And it depends on the size of the uh, uh, client that you're auditing, but Good audit firms, I mean, there's auditor rotation and stuff now that wasn't going on back then. It's not worth the risk level for the dollar amount of money you're making to potentially allow the client to do that stuff. So from that standpoint, SOX uh, has been relatively successful. Um, in achieving the goal of getting, you know, increasing, substantially increasing auditor independence. How could they have known and understood the business better in order to audit more efficiently and effectively? Where the money goes, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I feel like maybe some narrative uh, process documentation might have been helpful here. <laughs> Documenting what the controls, you know, uh, examining of internal controls and um, what the processes were for different things. Because if they didn't have outlined processes or they weren't following those processes, it would have told them right off the bat that there were problems, right? If they can't walk through this process and then test a few transactions and see if the processes are being followed. I mean, simply just like, what is your process for um, opening a checking account? Who gets to sign up on this? And how do you track where the accounts are and who reconciles all of them? All of that stuff should be documented for all the accounts. Like who's in charge of this stuff? And if the client can't tell you who's in charge of it, that then you should be like running, not walking away from this client. Um, so there's a lot of stuff like, so just thinking about some of the different processes we talked about um, in our chapter here on internal controls would be um, a good place to you know, come up with some of those answers. So is it the auditor's responsibility to verify that the client meets their tax exempt status? That's sort of an interesting question there. What would be the reporting requirements potentially for that? Would that, okay, so here's a question. If this is a nonprofit, would um, things that threaten the nonprofit status of the organization potentially concern 
or determine whether people were willing to donate. Yeah. Yes, right? It would. So this was a church-related nonprofit, right? Not a publicly traded company. So the focus is going to be a little bit different than it would be for a publicly traded company. For a publicly traded company, the emphasis we're going on with audits is, um, make sure I, yeah, I did. Okay. Uh, is would this change the mind of a reasonable investor potentially? Would this be something significant enough to potentially change somebody's opinion about this organization as a potential investment? Well, with nonprofits, the primary source of funding comes from donors and grantors. So then the question becomes, is this something that would potentially change the mind of donors or grantors who are putting money into this organization? And if the answer is yes, then there should be a disclosure of it. So if they, if they are doing something that puts that at risk, or if there have been threats to their nonprofit status based on inquiries from the IRS, those would potentially all be material disclosures. Um, they don't necessarily affect the dollars on the financial statements, but they should be in the footnotes. Um, did the preparation of checks violate the auditor's code of ethics? Did you got, did y'all catch what was going on? Um, Didn't what they, it says, um, I, was, I actually had a question about this. Like, was it the both Deloitte and LNH were wrote writing checks for PTL secret account to the bakers and other key employees? Yeah, they were preparing. They were preparing checks for something. Honestly, it doesn't even matter what they were preparing checks for. That that is not something that should ever happen. Like, you should an auditor should never ever be in a position where they are generating any kind of transactions within the organization. They can suggest adjusting journal entries based on findings from their audit. And, um, and if those journal entries that they are suggesting are material and the client would not have made them, then that's a um, potential finding on the audit. Because right. it says that like, um, they didn't sign them, obviously, because they were supposed to be writing them in the first place. So. Yep. Even if they weren't signing them, if they're generating them um, or even just calculating what they should be, that's a violation of independence because they're actually the source of the transactions. Like right. um, it used to be that you could potentially do some trusteeship type duties as like a on a consulting side maybe, but um, not a best practice even before Sarbanes-Oxley or any of that. So um, yeah, so auditors should never ever be doing that kind of thing. Like they should never be touching anything with cash unless they like find a material misstatement and they're saying, hey, there needs to be an audit adjustment here. Um, definitely a violation of independence um, in um, appearance, if not in fact, from that standpoint. So, all right, um, yeah, so there's that. I did wanna call out here at the end, I posted some information on registering for the red flag mania fraud case. This is kind of a cool fraud case that I found. I think we're gonna table the idea one. It just seems like we've got a lot of other cases going on. And I know that some of the people who are taking the course are starting um, advanced accounting in the second half of the semester here at an online program. And so I had sort of arranged to keep the first part of March and, uh, or I'm sorry, the last part of March and the first part of April a little bit lighter in this class so that they can concentrate on the heavy part of that course. So um, I think we're gonna pass on the idea one until I can, um, and maybe I'll do that in a future semester. If somebody worked on it and has some work that they would like to get extra credit for on that, please let me know. I will um, arrange something like either replacing an assignment score or something along that or maybe if you have another missing case or something. Now, this red flag mania fraud case, um, there's video sections that we will be um, watching some of them in class, some of them you'll do outside of class. You will be working in groups. So in particular, the week of March 6th um, for the land-based students, I really want everyone to be attending on Monday and Wednesday of that week before spring break because we will be doing some red flag mania stuff. Um, and then there are assessments right within um, the website for that. So get registered for that, uh, please, by March 1st. 
If you are unable to do so for some reason, then please let me know. Um, but you just go to this website here and you enter in this code that you're registering for and it should just get you all signed up. So if anyone runs into any questions on that, then please let me know and we'll wrap up with that. Thank you. You're welcome.